Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today's um, specialist working group briefing. Um, in the room, we have Michael Stone from the National Blood Authority, Ian Greve from the National Blood Authority, and myself, Elizabeth Arnold. Casey Bruning isn't with us at the moment. Um, online and via WebEx, we have Ashish Bayale, Damon Langood, excuse my pronunciation, Janikin Ravindran, Janet Wong, Matthew Cook, Philip Crispin, Pravin Hisaria, and I believe Stephen Alexander may be on the WebEx, but not on the teleconference. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, Michael Stone and we'll proceed with some housekeeping. Morning, uh, afternoon everyone, uh, thanks for joining us. This is the second briefing, um, as you will note, the materials Casey has sent around for members of the specialist working groups. There are four specialist working groups uh, for um, uh, immunology, neurology, haematology and transplantation medicine. Actually, Casey, do we have the total number of members? Do you know? No, I, um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, total number. Today we have um, a bit less than half of the group, I think. Um, now, today we plan to do this within two hours. We should be well within two hours. The briefing is in two parts. Uh, a shorter initial briefing from myself on the IG governance program, um, uh, how it uh, came about, I guess, the background to it through the Ernst & Young Review and the components of it, the role of the specialist working groups within that program. Um, and I'll try and do that uh, within 20 minutes. We'll see how we go. Um, and then a longer presentation from Elizabeth and Ian on the development of the um, national immunoglobulin uh, system and in particular how the criteria for use operate within that system. And that's particularly pertinent because um, there's an initial task which we will be asking the specialist working groups to undertake uh, around the uh, system development very soon. Um, just a couple of matters. Uh, we're using, as you would have seen in the briefing, uh, the video on the webinar and the sound on the telecom. We will be recording uh, the sound and that's only so that we can uh, make a cut of it for to, to provide to any other members who would like to hear the presentations later. Um, the recording will go over any, over any time for questions. We'll cut the questions out, I think, uh, for the purposes of using it later. So just so you're aware, um, if you ask a question, you'll be recorded at this, at this stage. Um, because we would like to get a clean recording of the presentation, I will ask you uh, just in a minute to put yourselves on mute um, and then save any questions until the end of firstly my presentation and then the end of um, uh, Elizabeth and Ian's presentation. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping I needed to go through. So is there any question just right now on what we're doing today initially? So in, in that case, without further ado, if, if you wouldn't mind uh, just muting your lines, we'll, um, I'll, I'll plow on and uh, forward to your questions when I've finished my initial presentation. <coughs> so in giving uh, a briefing today uh, on the IG program, Immunoglobulin Governance Program, uh, I'll just uh, provide the background and how we got here by way of um, mentioning aspects of the review which was undertaken uh, in 2012. And I know that some uh, people on the line uh, were participants to a greater or lesser extent in the consultations and process of that review and may have heard some of this briefing uh, in various ways. So apologies for any duplication for anything you've heard before, but it will be a, a quick overview. Uh, I think it's important now that we're at this point, that the uh, members of the specialist working groups uh, do understand that there's a, a past rationale for the establishment of this uh, new structure of committees. Uh, and then uh, I'll explain 
the elements of the governance program and where we've got to to date. So by way of uh, just a, a reasonably straightforward picture to give the context for why the governance review was uh, considered and that governments um, deliber deliberated about doing this review roughly between about 2009 and 2011 and it was undertaken in 2012. These are some of the factors. Now, some of the numbers have been updated for current numbers, but um, the factors in, in the minds of governments uh, under the National Blood Arrangement, so this is about publicly funded uh, immunoglobulin products, uh, the, the continuing high levels of um, demand increase year on year, uh, averaging around uh, 11 or 12 percent, and that uh, those levels having been sustained for uh, over a decade, um, the 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 order of cost within the blood, national blood arrangement. So in 15-16, the cost will be in excess of 450 million, and that's um, over 40 percent of the national blood products budget. Um, I'll go to the two points on first the the uh, the lack of a, a solid and consistent and robust data set on uh, the costs of, the use of, the benefits of IG products in the Australian system under the public funding arrangements. And then uh, looking at such data that was available, which is essentially the authorisation data through the blood service and the, um, uh, the supply data just from uh, our suppliers, uh, but particularly the authorisation data, uh, evidence of variability and a lack of an ability to explain whether variability between um, in, in, uh, geographic places, within specialities, between specialities, whether that variability was warranted or unwarranted and to what extent and why. Um, it was seen at the time that there was a disconnection, particularly in this case of a, um, a high cost by a pharmaceutical product, there was a disconnection between how the product was available, in other words, available quite readily to a large extent uh, and certainly free of charge, um, uh, and, and therefore without cost signal, disconnection between that and the, the sort of prescribing behaviour and, and management behaviour that uh, we might like to see in hospitals. Um, and then uh, there, Australia does subscribe to the policy of trying to achieve self-sufficiency or, or maximise it um, as far as possible and there is an in increasing gap between domestic and avail uh, available domestic supply and um, total supply so we're importing more product which matters if, if you subscribe to self-sufficiency. So there's some of the drivers just um, to, to reiterate, I guess there's there's a current um, pie chart from a recent report. So that's uh, that's actually 14, 15 uh, total cost of IVIG, and, and I should say, uh, actually that's all immunoglobulin products. The the um, the green part there, other than hyperimmune products, that does include the cost of domestic plasma. Uh, so in excess of 40% of the budget. The, the impression really, this is a very um, broad brush picture, but this is the impression that uh, was in the minds of governments and certainly stronger in some jurisdictions than others, but clotting factors, th these are the main components of the National Blood Arrangement, so essentially clotting factors um, stable in both budget and demand terms, fresh products uh, declining in fact, and then immunoglobulin products um, maintaining a steady increase. So just a quick word before going to the review itself. It's, it is interesting to think about um, a continuity of actions here. So the, the National Blood Arrangements were established in 2003 and one of the um, first major things the NBA did, in, which um, was, uh, actually commenced in 2004 was commence a national su uh, supply of imported IVIG products which brought about national sufficiency of supply which, which had previously not been available. 
Uh, now, because we started to import a substantial proportion of product even then, now even at that time, a governance element arose because there was the need to uh, confirm the blood service as the distributor and authoriser, well, distributor really at that time. There was a need to confirm an allocation approach to ensure that domestic product was um, taken up in, in the supply chain and, and uh, used to the fullest extent. The, um, in 2008, the criteria for use were uh, issued, signed off by health ministers and issued, and that was the culmination of, a, of an evidence-based process that had been going since, in fact, before 2003 when the MBA was set up uh, and included a systematic review work in 2004. Uh, of course, structured on an evidence basis, developed on an evidence basis, uh, used as a uh, set of access criteria, as a funding, as a reimbursement criteria. Um, there was a lot of work and people on the line may have been in, involved in um, a couple of years there in, in working up specifications for uh, a national system project, IT system project for managing uh, IVIG at the time that was called NIMS. Now that essentially didn't go ahead because um, the budget moved into a fairly straightened position with the GFC etc. So it didn't proceed at the time but there was a lot of effort put in there. We had the review of the criteria, the new edition of the criteria and then uh, leading to the review which I'll just touch on now. So Ernst & Young were commissioned to conduct the review uh, the government, government objectives stated in the terms of reference for the review were these, and um, so there's a balance there between, I guess you would say, clinical appropriateness and uh, the general subject of cost effectiveness. Excuse me. There's a point about um, ensuring that the framework, which was intended to be in place uh, right from 2008, where access to funded IVIG was based on the criteria, was actually being complied with and was being implemented consistently. So there's a point around equity in that in that point, equity of access. Um, and the last couple of points were about the evidence base and the need to build the proper data set to allow um, more robust evaluation and improvement of what was going on. So quite a busy slide. Uh, this one which just uh, serves to illustrate the three stages of the process of the review. The review um, was uh, um, guided with the advice of a, uh, an advisory committee that included uh, specialist clinical import, nursing import, the blood service, jurisdictional import, health economic type input. In fact, very much a, a sort of a precursor to the new National Immunoglobulin Governance Committee. But the three stages in this review uh, firstly covered the current, uh, the then current authorization process. This was um, a, a relatively um, close look at what happened in New South Wales and South Australia, including site visits and interviews, um, and then uh, confirmatory consultations with other jurisdictions just to analyse um, consistency with those two with the sort of process maps that had come out of South Australia and New South Wales. There was a level of um, compliance testing with the authorisation process against the criteria uh, and a certain set of findings about current practices uh, in terms of authorisation. The next stage was around uh, how clinicians prescribe and how hospitals manage product. And the, this included a fairly widely uh, Subscribe survey, um, 124 doctors, uh, 363 other types of respondents, focus groups, other consultations. This phase included also looking at other high cost drug schemes. Uh, it certainly had been in the mind of some jurisdictions that the review should solidly consider the proposition to move IVIG into the PBS just directly. So this element needed to be there. There was re research on international approaches and this, out of this work um, there were a certain set of findings but EY started to design their concepts for the approach going forward. 
then the third phase was to develop some options to put forward to governments. So in terms of findings, at the level of the authorisation processes and management arrangements, uh, there were findings around, uh, I should say at this point, it, um, for a detailed view of these, the, um, the executive summary of this review is on our website and we can certainly email that, that to you as a link or a document should anyone like to look at that uh, if you contact Casey afterwards. But um, So the, there were findings around variation in management practices, um, lack of clarity of roles and responsibilities in the process, in particular a lack of uh, empowerment of the blood service as the, uh, or at least largely the national authoriser, noting that in some places other parties do play a role in authorisation. Um, in general, relative ease of access to the product and uh, at least not systematic, fully systematic requirements for evidence, certainly not consistent. Um, and then confirming the lack of systematic collection of data that allowed for uh, progressive uh, improvement and evaluation. Also, lack of a national prioritisation plan. So, in terms of clinical governance, uh, EY found variation in IVIG use and prescribing within diagnoses, between diagnoses, uh, internationally and, and the international data of course is vexed because not every country maintains the same level of access as a policy matter or a funding matter but even where you can look you can look at other comparable countries for example the UK uh, there there are marked discrepancies within particular um, comparable um, uh, uh, indications in terms of prescribing rates, etc. Um, no price transparency and um, at least at a systematic level uh, no focus on cost effectiveness and, and not, a, not a consistent consideration of um, potential for using alternative therapies. So these are system level observations. The, where EY then came to was to put forward a model which was an integrated framework. So the, the potential to put um, funding for IVIG into the PBS model was considered. Uh, this really was put forward as an alternative non-PBS based model and a set of um, measures proposed to, to, to create this framework. This is the concept of it, that you have um, uh, a set of functions that are about determining eligibility, which is about the criteria and the Evident, the assessment of evidence and what you do to improve that evidence, and the policy decisions that are made. The funding uh, is around you know, essentially how the fun funding model works, possible introduction of shadow pricing, devolved budgets, etc. Um, the prescription and approval, uh, in fact, sorry, I've forgotten that there's a more elaborated slide that picks up things like having uh, more consistent forms, etc., standardised processes uh, for appro approval and review, uh, defined pathways where escalation was required, performance improvement uh, at a at a system national system wide level or process wide level. That that was a new concept. So, creating some processes to in fact uh, review data, review reporting from data, and then. Uh, develop indicators for performance of the system, which could be, for example, around compliance with the criteria, it could be around um, outcomes as much as uh, uh, compliance. So there's a quality and a, a compliance element to that potentially. A set of things were considered that could be developed into a uh, performance improvement program. And then a set of um, actions identified potentially in education and training uh, where uh, in particular, junior doctors and, and nurses are often the front line of um, managing IVIG or of obtaining IVIG after it's been um, prescribed by a, a supervising specialist and EY identified a lack of awareness at that level and a, a need to target people at, working at that level around how the framework works. And in the middle then, um, a sort of... Uh, uh, 
thread through everything and a, a resource for all of these activities, uh, a new uh, national system which would be uh, the data system uh, generated from the authorisation process and including the um, data around patient review and to an extent outcomes. So EY framed a set of uh, recommendations about elements of a program and these uh, I think you've had materials around the current IG program. What, after, after the EY recommendations, the NBA and our jurisdictional colleagues went through a couple of rounds of producing and rehashing a business case, etc. And ultimately, in September 2013, um, the NBA ended up with a jurisdictional endorsement to commence work across the elements of this program and we have some project resourcing to do that uh, over a, a number of years. So the, the main elements then sort of match uh, largely the, the EY recommended components. We have an element um, around uh, confirming the policy for access and then certainly a, um, a key focus will be how we, how we continue to evolve the criteria for access. Um, and that piece of work around evolving the criteria uh, is already something at a at a at a high level that's been considered by the uh, National Immunoglobulin and Governance Advisory Committee, which is the next um, <coughs> element in the circle. So that that committee has been formed. It's had its first meeting. The first meeting considered papers uh, across a number of these uh, elements to just uh, get some level of endorsement for the MBA team to keep developing these program elements. NIGAC has um, membership, uh, one, one member from and a proxy from each of the key specialities represented by the working groups and those people are the chairs of the working groups. Uh, there's a nursing rep, there are reps from a couple of patient organisations, one in immunology, one in neurology. Um, there are government officials there um, from I think three different jurisdictions. There is an epidemiologist, there's a health economic expert. Um, Lee McJames as the general manager of the MBA is a member. So the idea of NIGAC was to create a national forum where all of the different perspectives on uh, governance and management of publicly funded IG in Australia could be brought together as a key advisory body for uh, uh, jurisdictions and the MBA, JB, Jurisdictional Blood Committee and the MBA. Uh, the IG system is a project which is well underway. Elizabeth will talk further about that. And the programs around knowledge development could include or should include uh, education and training in, to some level, uh, the development of programs around research or proposals around research say uh, guidelines development, etc., consensus um, statement development, there, that is still to be developed and that's a very much uh, the territory for the specialist working groups. And similarly, performance improvement, the starting ideas are there, but um, those two elements in particular, together with the criteria, will be the main uh, areas, I think, where the specialist working groups will, will work. And we have, over on the left, we have... Um, uh, for, for what it's worth, created a sort of uh, brand, if you like, under the logo. So um, we wanted to start off with having a um, an identifiable badge for materials that come out of the new program. So one of those, or one tranche of those materials <clears throat> is this new document, which I imagine everyone on the, um, on the call uh, has received. Um, if you haven't, you probably should have, and and contact your normal blood service representative if if you haven't got it. So this is a national policy document that sits alongside the criteria for use document, and this describes the um, the management and access arrangements that go with the authorization process under the criteria. Really, this is the first time that this has been formally and, and publicly described uh, and, and really sh is a corollary of the criteria that perhaps should have been there the whole time. Uh, so this has now been 
uh, communicated to all prescribers as far as we know and uh, along with that policy there are new um, authorization forms which um, went into live mode if you like on Wednesday this week, uh, 5th of November. Um, associated with this policy we have the developments that brought subcutaneous Ig and uh, NIG into the at least for immun immunological purposes, into the authorization framework. Uh, as I say, there's defined roles there for the blood service or anyone else who's performing the authorization function. Uh, there's a, a more standardized description of the review po process there for patient review uh, and a, a, a defined process where reminder letters will be sent out, etc. cetera. Um, there is a statement and a description, an initial description in there about coordinated in-hospital management of um, IG products and that's an area we'll be developing further. That's a more progressive implementation up until the system actually launches. Um, and then along with that, as I mentioned, we've established NIGAC and we're in the middle of establishing the, or we've just now established the specialist working groups and the system is in development. There's been a lot of work to date. The team is uh, Melody Black and Casey Bruning, uh, who work to me, and then Ian and Elizabeth and others are in the system development team, and they work to Peter O'Halloran at the MBA. Uh, in terms of the National Network of Committees, so we've established NIGAC. Uh, we're now talking to you as members of the specialist working groups. The idea here was to create... Um, uh, the national layer of committees that could progress um, a national program for improving the governance and management of IG of, of IG products, uh, and which would then be able to be a key advisor upwards, if you like, and that's in inverted commas. You have to put it in some direction or another um, to governments. So the jurisdictional blood committee and the MBA as the implementation arm of that. Um, so there's a key advisory role there for the specialist working groups through NIGAC and then NIGAC to JBC and to the MBA. Um, and that, that middle level of committees, the new committees, will be supported uh, in secretariat terms by the MBA project team, by, by Casey largely. Um, uh, and then uh, the intention is to create this as a network. So there are already committees and groups operating in jurisdictions as user groups or uh, under other names and also then committees um, of relevance in hospitals or health services. So the idea is to create, uh, and, and this is certainly not yet in, fully in place, but to create a network which is integrated where the different levels and different committees are talking to each other as relevant. And how we develop that in itself will be an important topic uh, to talk through and work through with each specialist working group in your specialist areas. So this, um, terrible as a slide, it's just uh, cut from the terms of reference for the specialist working groups. Um, the point there is that there are elements here uh, in the terms of reference for the group which pick up all of the elements really of the overall program. So the idea is that the specialist working groups bring together a small um, group of people within the speciality to talk at a national level, to interface with NIGAC, to interface with your specialist uh, committees, societies, other bodies, to interface with the local level committees, uh, and, and you know, create a lot of this program in, in reality. And in terms of what are the immediate next steps for the specialist working groups, we're doing these introductory briefings. Um, Within, uh, within this month and early into December, we will be uh, asking the specialist working groups to go through a consultation process to validate, I think is, is the best word that Ian's uh, quite rightly been using, uh, validate the, um, the values and the way the, the current criteria are structured and, and uh, programmed into the, the new IG system as the first cut that will be configurable in that system over time. 
and then early in the new year we will bring the specialist working groups back together to look across the broader uh, program, look at the various lines of activity, look at the recommendations and suggestions from the EY review and, and other um, inputs that may have uh, come in since then and develop a broader work plan. And then we'll be integrating each of the specialist working group work plans through conversations in NIGAC and we'll come up with this forward program of work uh, across those various stream, um, elements of the program, of the overall governance program. So that's where I was going to end. Um, and so at this point I'd invite you to unmute if, you, if you'd like to ask a question. Happy to take any, any questions um, uh, thus far. If everyone, um, certainly I'll be here um, at the end of uh, Elizabeth and Ian's presentation, so happy to take anything then that may come to mind. But if there's no questions now, we might I'll hand over to to Elizabeth. Hi everyone, I am just going to do a very quick IG system overview uh, just to talk about the objectives of today's sessions and to reiterate the overall capability. So the objective is to show you how the system will deliver capability across three of the five key streams of work, which is system administration, prescribers and authorisers. Today we won't be discussing uh, the nursing and dispensing aspects because it's um, specifically related to how the administrative changes that Michael was alluding to need to be translated from the Blue Book into the system and ensure that we're not changing the clinical context of the criteria. So this diagram just shows uh, the system administration lane across the top of the screen, which is the uh, overall IG system 2B business process. The green boxes um, talk about where there is system capability and the criteria management is also system capability, but it's very limited number of users that will be here at the National Blood Authority. And the focus is really how the criteria, the blue book, drives or underpins the capability for prescribers requesting an authorisation, how the authoriser then uses that information in the assessment process, and then how it manages the review process. So um, it's a very short presentation for me because I'm going to hand over now to um, Ian Grieve, who will actually take you through the, the functional overview and how those changes are taking shape. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, as Elizabeth said, I am going to take you through uh, step by step um, uh, through a set of wireframes and uh, very, well, uh, somewhat early mock ups of system capability so that you can uh, get a sense as to what we intend to use the criteria for use and those values that we're talking about validating, where we'll be using those in the system um, to drive various bits of logic uh, and assessment. Just to uh, to set the scene, we just to look at the current state and the, the paper forms that uh, are in existence for each specialty. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with these forms or their, um, or their predecessor. The forms are, I think there's four different forms based on different um, areas of specialty. And each of those forms contain that uh, section uh, halfway down the form which uh, you have that opportunity to indicate or to nominate the indication that uh, you're choosing to prescribe uh, immunoglobulin and uh, provide some extra information as to how your patient qualifies uh, for access. In the uh, 2B state, in the, the future uh, scenario, we will replace those four different forms by a single uh, electronic form uh, which is dynamically driven by the criteria for use. And when I say dynamically driven, uh, I'll get into the detail of that, but uh, based on the values that you select and the values that you enter, determines what the next question or the next set of fields are that you need to provide. So just to walk through this form uh, fairly quickly, the very top part of the form is where you would nominate the patient. So there's not a great deal of difference uh, to the existing form there where you want to capture the, the patient's name and whatnot so we can identify them and some 
uh, indication of their previous treatments. The next two uh, boxes on that form are describing or, or letting us know who the uh, medical officers are involved in this particular request, the top being the, the treating medical specialist who will take responsibility for the longer term treatment of the patient, and the requesting medical officer being the person who is physically filling out the form uh, and we accept may have less of a relationship with the patient in the longer term. We then come to a, a more interesting part of the form, more interesting in my, <laughs> in my mind, I guess where you uh, select the uh, diagnosis, the indication and address the qualifying criteria. I will step deeper into those in just a few moments. About two thirds of the way down we have a section where you can nominate uh, the infusion method, whether that be intravenous or subcutaneous, and the treating facility, the administering facility, and where we expect the product to be dispensed from for this particular authorization. Uh, second from the bottom, there's a box there in which the prescriber would nominate or uh, propose the dose that they would like to prescribe, and finally at the bottom, a, an area for recording the patient's consent to the collection retention and use of their personal uh, data. I'll step deeper now into the, the more interesting part of the form, being the area in which you would address the patient's diagnosis and how they meet the criteria for use. So stepping through this part of the, the form at the top, we need to select the medical condition. And this field is aligned to the medical conditions as they are set out in the criteria for use. Once you select one of those medical conditions, the fields below that uh, are reconfigured. Unfortunately, this slide is, is static, but uh, there will be a, a lot of reconfiguration of the form as you select that, that medical condition. For some medical conditions, they are described in the criteria at a, a high level, and from a reporting perspective, we're often interested in uh, some more specifics about the condition, uh, in which case we prompt the user to uh, provide us with information about the specific condition. So in this particular uh, scenario, acquired hypogammaglobulinemia, secondary to hematological malignancies. Uh, once we select that, we're interested in which hematological malignancy we're talking about. Also, once you choose that medical condition, the uh, drop-down box uh, for indications is refreshed with only the indications that are applicable to that medical condition that you've chosen. So by doing this, we are narrowing down the, uh, the scope of, our, of the information we need to provide. We choose the indication, and at that point in time, the qualifying criteria below it are reconfigured to prompt you to, um, to tell us how your patient meets the criteria, or which criteria your patient meets. So in this scenario, we've uh, said that our patient has had uh, recurrent or severe bacterial infections, and they also meet the criteria of evidence of hypogammaglobulinemia. Once again, as you tick those boxes, the uh, fields below that, the supporting evidence fields, are reconfigured based on those ticks. So when you tell us that the patient has had recurrent or severe bacterial infections, the system also wants to know a little bit more information to support that claim. So if there has been recurrent or severe bacterial infections in this scenario, what number of infections has there been in the last three months and perhaps how severe have those uh, infections been and are there any more um, comments that you would like to add to support that claim. And similarly, when you select evidence of hypogammaglobulinemia as a, uh, to, to state that your patient meets that criteria, we also prompt for some additional supporting information about that. Uh, what was the IgG level? What was the test state? Uh, and how can we interpret those results in a standardised way. So that is the, the dynamic part of the form, which is making sure that we're only uh, bothering you to collect the information that is relevant to the condition for which you are uh, requesting access to IG uh, therapy. It also allows us to uh, collect a bit more information than what is currently on the form because we aren't trying to squeeze all of those fields onto a single paper form. After that point, you would uh, nominate your dose, and I'll walk, step into the dosing uh, area a bit later on. You would nominate your dose, you would record the consent of your patient, 
and then you submit the request. At the time of submission of the request, uh, that's sent to the uh, blood service for assessment, uh, and if the uh, authoriser uh, is uh, happy that your patient meets the qualifying criteria, then they go ahead and approve that um, authorisation. A note to make about this is uh, introducing a, an online system in order to lodge that uh, request doesn't preclude uh, the opportunity for discussion uh, between the authoriser and the prescriber um, as currently happened. It's simply a, uh, an electronic way to actually lodge the formal request. Once you are approved, an approval record uh, is created against the patient record and the, the value of that is that it now gives us a single source of truth uh, about a patient's authorisation. What has been authorised uh, by the authoriser and what is the state of that authorisation until something changes. Perhaps the authorisation time frame expires or perhaps uh, a dose is changed or perhaps uh, a continuing authorisation request is lodged. Over the course of time, treatment occurs, and this may be a, a, a repeated process if it's a, a longer-term maintenance dose, or it may be that uh, one-off dose. The treatment occurs, and at a point in time, as set out by the approval, um, a review is required, and the system will uh, drive the review time frames based on what is set out in the criteria and the approval to notify the prescriber of uh, the need to review a patient. And when you look at that notification that you get from the system, uh, we then present you with the necessary form to fill out, uh, which again is uh, fully configured from the criteria for use. And of course the prescriber must uh, complete that review and if they are uh, looking for continued access, need to uh, complete a continuing authorization request which brings us all the way around to the beginning of our process again in terms of submitting a request. Here's a, uh, a wireframe mock-up as to how, the, how capturing reviews may look in the system. Um, the, the top area being uh, where the medical officer conducting the review is, uh, is nominated. The review criteria, uh, which is driven by the criteria for use. So the part of the criteria for use for each condition that indicates what the criteria are at review are uh, presented to the user and again you tick which criteria your patient uh, condition meets and provide some supporting information to um, support that claim. At the bottom of the review form you have the opportunity to record your review outcome and the review outcomes may be that the patient will be seeking therapy in which case we're interested in knowing at what date we anticipate ceasing therapy. Or alternatively, you may wish to request continued uh, treatment for the patient. And if you are uh, choosing to uh, request continued access, you move on to the next step, which is to fill out that uh, continuing authorisation request. And you'll know that this looks a lot like the original initial authorisation request. Uh, we need to know who the patient is, uh, you don't need to re-nominate that because we all are already operating in the context of the patient's record. Uh, the specialists are already set out. Uh, the requesting medical officer is the person who is filling out the form. And then we come to the review criteria. Once again, uh, can be pre-populated from those review outcomes. At the bottom of the form, you need to nominate uh, what you would like to do about the dose. Would you like to uh, continue the existing dose for a certain uh, period of time? or would you like to alter the dose and you have the opportunity to set out a different um, dosing regimen. I'll take a moment there to also add that during the course of a uh, authorisation there may be need to alter the dose and what's not shown in my processes and mock-ups in this situation is that there will be the capability to lodge a dose change request uh, which would then be approved or otherwise by the authoriser and once that happens the authorisation record against the patient record would be updated. Again, the information updated in real time so that we have that single source of truth about the patient's authorisation. So now we come to talking about the role of the criteria 
in working through that end-to-end -end process, uh, there's a couple of different areas where the criteria is coming into play. It comes into play in uh, nominating that diagnosis and nominating which criteria your patient's condition meets and also in uh, asking those supporting questions that we refer to as evidence items. And once again, it comes into play during the assessment to provide some additional, um, additional information to the authoriser so that they're in a, a good position to provide a, a consistent assessment of the authorisation. And the dosing is also impacted by what's set out in the criteria. Once the authorisation is approved, the review timeframes are driven by the criteria, notwithstanding any sort of overriding um, input from the authoriser. And then the review criteria that your patient needs to meet to uh, gain continued access are also, also driven by the criteria for use. So I can't stress uh, enough the importance of the, the criteria in driving the logic of the system. The problem that we face is that the, uh, the criteria as it stands needs to be nudged into a, a format that the, uh, the computer can, um, can digest and can use to drive uh, a decision tree. So in our work, uh, to date we've been working on uh, working through the criteria to put the criteria into a, a hierarchical form in order to drive a decision tree which will give us the, the logic that we need for the system. A very important point to make about that is that in making those changes to the criteria, and we refer to these as the administrative changes, in making the administrative changes we have absolutely no uh, desire to make any change to the clinical intent of the criteria. So if once our work is done in putting the criteria into the system, if once our work is done in doing that, we have changed the clinical meaning of the criteria, we need to take a step back and ask ourselves the question, uh, why did we do that and, and how do we get that back to being, uh, sorry, back to saying the same thing as the original uh, version did. So let's talk through the administrative changes. Throughout the uh, various slides coming up, I'm going to refer to the existing uh, structure of the criteria and compare that to, uh, to the place that we need to go with the criteria. But it's useful at this point to look at the existing structure, and on the right-hand side on this slide uh, shows us the existing structure, and it looks somewhat flat. We have the medical condition at the top, and then everything falls underneath the medical condition from indication, the description, the qualifying criteria, exclusion criteria, review criteria, all related up to the medical condition. What we need to do is, um, is to break that down and understand those relationships uh, within the box. We need to break it down uh, within some of the boxes like qualifying criteria, break down some of those phrases um, to make sure that we are assessing those at the tightest level that we can from a, a system perspective. Where we need to get to uh, from a system perspective is a more fine-grained decision tree or hierarchical uh, structure. So we have the medical conditions on the left-hand side uh, being that very top-level uh, description of the medical condition. Breaks down to having one or more indications for use and then that is broken down into a qualifying area a review area and a dose area. And within each of those, we break that down hierarchically again. So within qualifying criteria, you may have one or more qualifying criteria. And within a qualifying criterion, we may have one or more, perhaps none, I'll add, <laughs> evidence items or additional pieces of information to support your assertion that your patient's condition meets uh, the qualifying criteria. That same pattern is um, repeated in the review space and in dosing, uh, for each indication there may be more than one dose, but there will be a dose, um, but maybe more than one. There is also some logic that exists uh, at that uh, one, two, three, fourth level down of qualifying criteria, or review criteria uh, and dose, which is uh, a bit of logic which will say you need to meet one of these criterion, 
or you need, need to meet some of these criteria, or you need to meet all of these criteria in order to access uh, the product. That's true of the qualifying space, true of the review space, and in the dosing area, you may be, um, if you are authorised, you may be authorised for one, or you may be authorised for uh, more than one of the doses that are set out in that area. For example, you may be authorised for an induction dose uh, plus a maintenance dose. In a different scenario, you may be authorised for a single one dose. So let's step through that uh, structure uh, step by step. The medical condition uh, part of that decision tree is fairly straightforward and we don't really need to do a huge amount of work on the medical condition. The medical condition captures the description, the level of evidence, the justification for the level of evidence, uh, the exclusion criteria, chapter, specialty and keyword for, uh, for the purposes of search. So it's all the stuff that sits very neatly underneath the medical condition and for the most part the system doesn't need to do much in terms of driving logic. So we're pretty happy with medical condition. Indication on the other hand, we, uh, we then start to need to look at what is there and how can we uh, break that down so it is digestible for the system and so that the system can um, apply the logic that it needs to apply. On the left hand side you can see the current state of the criteria for one particular condition, inflammatory myopathies. And I've chosen this condition uh, for no particular reason other than uh, it's a, a good example of, or oh, sorry, it illustrates some of these examples quite well. The, on the left hand side, the relationship between the qualifying criteria and each of the indications is not explicitly set out. But there is an implied relationship and it's relatively clear in most cases. And in this inflammatory myopathy uh, case, it is uh, crystal clear. But we need to validate all of those. I'm going to say that that's crystal clear. You may disagree with me. And that's the important part of bringing the specialist working groups into this process to make sure what I do as, uh, as a clinically naive business analyst working in the IT space, uh, making sure that we're not changing the meaning of the criteria from a clinical perspective. Now, when I say uh, the implied relationship is fairly clear, on the right-hand side, uh, in the red, you can see we've set out the indications as they currently stand and the criteria as they currently stand. And you can see because in this scenario uh, the criteria is almost a verbatim repetition of the indication, we can uh, draw that relationship quite well. But that relationship is not necessarily clear in all scenarios. In this one it is. What we also need to have a look at when we're looking at indications in, in our uh, administrative review of the criteria is being uh, on the lookout for where there is a repetition between uh, indications and qualifying criteria. So in this scenario we can see the indication is set out as uh, patients with PM or DM with significant muscle weakness, unresponsive to corticosteroids and other immunosuppressive agents. With the indication saying that and the qualifying criteria saying almost the same, there is no, uh, or there is very little difference between the indication and qualifying criteria. It would beg the question, why do we need uh, criteria for an indication like that? We need to ask the question, is the indication specified uh, more tightly than is useful? If we uh, tighten up the indication too much, what we don't gain is any, um, any evidence base around the particular criteria that the patient did or didn't meet in order to, uh, to gain access to the product. What we can also um, see in this scenario is that the uh, indication on this top level um, uh, example is actually tighter than the qualifying criteria. Um, the qualifying criteria says that you may have uh, patients with PM or DM who have significant muscle weakness or dysphagia and have not responded as yada yada yada, whereas the indication doesn't refer to uh, dysphagia. So uh, in this scenario, the indication appears, and I, I do qualify that with appears from my clinically naive perspective, to be uh, tighter than the qualifying criteria.
We then come down to qualifying criteria, and it's important to, to restate once again that the qualifying criteria needs to be uh, set out, um, sorry, related to indications rather than being related to the top level medical condition. Where there is one in, only one indication for the medical condition, then I guess that, that relationship is true, but where there is more than one indication, we need to be clear about this. We also need to break down any criteria uh, that um, have more than one test contained within them. So once again, looking at patients with PM or DM who have significant muscle weakness or dysphagia and have not responded to corticosteroids and other immunosuppressive agents has three different tests in there. There's a test for significant muscle weakness, there is a test for dysphagia, and there is a test as to whether or not the patient has responded to uh, other uh, treatments. But if we only keep that as one criterion, we don't begin to understand which part of that criteria did the patient meet or not meet. And not meet is probably the, uh, the, the more important scenario so that we understand uh, where people are, are not accessing the product and, uh, and whatnot. In doing that, in breaking down that criteria, we also need to provide some extra clarity around the order of logic. So in the top uh, panel there, we show that as it can be extrapolated from that, uh, that phrasing. But what it is unclear is whether it means we need to meet, uh, reading from the bottom panel, A or B, and then C, or do you need to meet A or a combination of B and C? So in the current uh, state of play with the criteria, there are many examples where that order of logic is uh, unclear. I would uh, I would say that from a um, reading it as a as a human being, it is uh, somewhat easy to imply that uh, that intent. However, um, sorry, infer that in intent. However, from the system perspective, we need to make sure that we are absolutely clear in putting that into the system. And once again, we want to validate that to make sure that uh, we are not making an assumption that can't be proven. As I said, each qualifying criteria needs to define evidence items. Uh, additional pieces of information or a measure, more, uh, more useful if it's a measure, to support a claim that the patient's condition meets the criteria. And uh, preferably an evidence item needs to be defined for each criterion. However, I accept there may be some uh, scenarios where evidence uh, may not be able to be provided or it's um, you know, not appropriate to provide any further information. But as an example, if we have a, a qualifying criteria that the patient's IgG level is less than four grams per litre, then it stands to reason that the evidence to support that would be to ask what the IgG level is. We would also ask for an interpretation of that result, and I'll get to that uh, in a few moments. And we may even ask for an attachment of the lab results. Now, where I'm saying that we may do this, this is something that we really need the input of the specialist working groups to tell us what is appropriate to ask for at this particular point in time. If we put ourselves in the shoes of a prescriber filling out this form, uh, what information uh, can the prescriber reasonably put into the form? And also, from uh, the end game perspective, what information is useful for us um, in terms of building uh, an evidence base? A different example of a qualifying criteria, maybe a much more simple qualifying criterion, uh, where we ask, uh, or sorry, where the patient needs to have had recurrent bacterial infections. The evidence there that we had asked for may be that we want to know how many bacterial infections uh, did the patient have in the last six months. So in terms of defining an evidence item, and this is getting right down into a, a fair degree of detail, uh, as uh, Michael mentioned, the, the system will be configurable so that uh, as um, changes to the criteria occur over the, the period of time, uh, we don't need to launch into a, a new uh, development phase from an IT perspective and a system development perspective in order to get this in. Uh, we do this through configuration. And evidence items can be configured in the following way. First of all, we need to configure what the prompt text is, what, basically what the field label will be. Um, we need to tell the system what type of data we're expecting the user to enter. 
Are we expecting them to enter a number? And if we are expecting a number, what kind of unit would be appropriate for that number? Are we looking for a, a single line of text? Perhaps we're looking for something a bit more narrative-like, in which case we provide multiple lines. Or are we asking for a value from a, a drop-down box? And in which case we need to define what the appropriate values would be. Interpretation of results is a, an additional drop-down box that would uh, be presented in scenarios like where we are asking for IgG level. Where those measures are subject to the variations in lab reference ranges, it stands to reason that we should provide you a way with uh, giving us a standardised interpretation of that result, in which case we need to define what the appropriate and valid values would be for an interpretation. They could be as simple as uh, above the range, below the range, or normal, uh, and then they can become more complex from there. In providing that, uh, that test result, should we ask also for a date that that test was, uh, was, was done? If we are having uh, a evidence item which is uh, a drop-down list or even perhaps a number, what is the applicable qualifying values? So if we're, for example, if we're asking for uh, a severity of a disease, what would the qualifying value be? If the severity is uh, low, medium and high, um, perhaps only high would qualify us. And finally, an option to allow commentary, in which case the system would render a text box for providing comments. And this is an example of a configured evidence item, so the prompt text, IgG level, and down the bottom you can see that the system renders that. The type is a number, in which case it uh, renders a, a box for putting the number in, and the unit then grams per litre is also populated. We are requesting a, a date and uh, that uh, space is provided for the users to put their date in. The interpretation of results, because we're looking for a standardised response, is rendered as a drop-down box. And because we are also asking for, or we are allowing commentary, we render a comments box for the prescriber to put extra information in. And once again, just a more simple version of that, prompt text number of bacterial infections of the last six months, uh, the type is a number, there is no unit, uh, and we also allow commentary. We then come to uh, specifying a dose in the system. Uh, I wanted to put this slide up here because it demonstrates how the dose uh, form, or the, the panel where you nominate a dose in the authorization form is configured. There are four examples there based on different types of doses and different variations in, uh, in the parameters of dosing. So at the top we've got a, a fairly straightforward uh, dose which is a, a definitive uh, range um, and you enter that in, you tell us when it's required and we move forward. The second example is an example where a divided dose may be appropriate, in which case we ask how many divisions would you like to use. The third is a maintenance dose, which is obviously a, a repeated dose, and we need to ask questions about what the frequency of that dose would be. And finally, a single one-off dose. Um, no, this looks like it's a, uh, more like a maintenance dose, my apologies. The standardised, or the, the, the dose forms as they are set out there, has the aim to reduce the confusion and the ambiguity around what was meant by a prescriber in a dose so that the authoriser is in a better position to, um, to assess that dose and that flows through to uh, the dispensing space so that the dispenser has a greater understanding as to what was meant um, by a prescriber's dose that they have set out. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Based on those configured values, and now this is the same uh, dosing form, just expanded with some extra information. So based on those values uh, that will be configured in the system, uh, when you enter a dose in here, uh, well, sorry, when you select the dose, the dose is shown at the top. Um, so in this situation, four, sorry, 0 0.4 grams per kilogram every four weeks, and then some additional information about that. The patient's weight has already been entered. This prescriber is entering in a dose of 0 0.6 oh, uh, grams per uh, kilogram. 
Now this is outside the range set out by the criteria, so the system uh, pesters you with a, an alert to say that that dose is outside the range of the criteria, please provide a reason for that. The system calculates the total dose based on that, so 0.6 times uh, 80, I'm hoping that says 48, and my eyes deceive me. Uh, we can set out a frequency, and if the frequency uh, is shorter than the frequency set out in the criteria for use, once again, the system pesters you to provide uh, some rationale as to why you wish to do that. You can nominate the length of treatment, and again, the system will ask the question uh, of the criteria for use, uh, what's, the, what's the review period? If the review period is six months, the system wouldn't allow you to uh, nominate a length of treatment beyond that because we need to make sure that you do the review and that you request continued access um, for continued treatment. You can uh, nominate the preferred product or in the current situation the, uh, the preferred imported product. The system at this point will uh, conduct two tests. The first test will be to uh, evaluate the allocation rules based on whether or not the condition is configured for a domestic or imported product. Now that's set through various different policy settings. Um, and if it is the uh, imported product, which imported product should um, be prescribed? If you've chosen a different product, again, the system will ask for a rationale as to why you would like to do that. The second test that's uh, undertaken at that point is to have a look at the patient record, if they are an existing patient in the system, to understand whether or not a, a do not prescribe advisory has been placed on the patient record to make sure that we're not prescribing something that we actually know that the patient has uh, perhaps had a uh, severe reaction to. Um, I think that's all to say about the dosing form. I'm just going to talk about the data that, that drives that uh, dosing form. And we come back down to our friend, the criteria, and uh, in the, the top right-hand side, we can see how the criteria sets out a dose. So the doses are normally expressed as one of those neat one-liners. But as we know, there's so much information contained within each of those one-liners, so we need to extrapolate uh, some more atomic values out of that. So, um, you know, whereas definitive dose uh, can be prescribed, what is that definitive dose? Perhaps 0 0.4 and that's it. Uh, perhaps it's a range, so 0 0.4 to 1, where the dose might be given as a divided dose and how many divisions is appropriate for this particular um, indication. Where the dose uh, should be provided as a single one-off dose, where the dose is uh, one that should be repeated, perhaps uh, in the scenario of maintenance doses. And are there any other instructions or conditions that relate to the dose? What we also need to do in our work is to define uh, subcutaneous doses where they are appropriate also. So in terms of uh, defining dose parameters, this is, these are the values we need to, to set out. The, uh, the top two parameters we already set out, um, about being the dose name and the, the text or the expression of the dose. From that we need to extrapolate what the minimum dose per kilogram is, the maximum dose per kilogram, whether or not the dose can be administered as a divided dose, if so, the minimum number of divisions, the maximum number of divisions, uh, whether it's a one-off dose, and then a minimum and maximum frequency if that's appropriate, and any other information to go with the dose. And all, by extrapolating that information into those uh, single values will allow the system to do all of those alert and prompting for additional reasons. And finally we come to review. We've, uh, we've been approved, we've uh, had our treatment and we've now come to the point of review. The review part of the, the criteria is perhaps where uh, things become the most inconsistent across the, the various conditions. And uh, what we need to do is to try and bring that into a consistent form, and we need to try and set out what the, in particular, what the criteria for continued access are for those conditions for which there are continuing access is available. We also need to set up rules around what the frequency of the review is, who needs to do the review, whether that be uh, a medical officer of a particular specialty or whether or not it can be any medical officer doing that review, uh, what should be assessed at review, 
and whether or not cessation should be considered. And once again, review rules will relate to crisis, sorry, the review right rules will relate to indications rather than uh, to the medical condition itself. Uh, this just sets out, I think, pretty much everything I just said. Review, whether or not review is required, whether continuing treatment is permitted on the same authorisation. Uh, if continuing treatment is permitted, whether or not uh, you need to uh, formally apply for that continued treatment. Uh, some of those will be policy settings, I'll accept that. Uh, what the maximum length of the initial authorisation is, that will drive when your review would be due. Um, and perhaps there is a, a different uh, need for different review criteria for stable patients as opposed to patients who are yet to, uh, uh, to demonstrate a response to therapy, which is why we have a, a maximum length of uh, the initial authorisation and then what a subsequent review time frame, or perhaps more um, correctly, what the subsequent review frequency would be. Uh, who must undertake the review, as I discussed. If a review is not required, what the maximum length of the authorisation would be, and on what frequency should cessation of treatment be considered. Um, now, the concept of demonstrated clinical benefit is an underlying principle of the criteria for use. So where uh, the current, uh, current criteria makes that statement but doesn't go into much more detail about what uh, demonstrated clinical benefit might be for a particular scenario, we need to break that down so we can understand or apply particular tests um, to the, the patient's condition to see whether or not they have had that demonstrated clinical benefit. As I said, review criteria may be different for stable patients as opposed to um, patients yet to demonstrate a response. And review criteria may also have uh, evidence items. Which brings us to the end of our uh, decision tree. And I just wanted to conclude by uh, talking through what we are um, trying to achieve here. Uh, the administrative changes to the system are driven by a need to get uh, structured and consistent data into the system so that we can provide uh, logic and intelligence to the, the processing of that uh, data. What we need to try and achieve is clearer separation of indications and qualifying criteria, increased clarity around uh, which indication each qualifying and review criterion is related to, uh, try and increase the clarity around review criteria for each indication, increase the clarity as, as to which doses are appropriately uh, prescribed for each indication, remove ambiguity, and uh, define evidence items. And evidence items um, is probably a, a fairly chunky piece of work in defining those evidence items. Some of those are directly um, discernible from the text of the criteria, um, where a, a criteria says that the IgG level should be less than four, the evidence item uh, becomes quite uh, easy to determine. Uh, however, where a criteria says uh, something, I guess, a bit more complex, we need to understand what the appropriate test or, or what the appropriate information is that would support that claim of the patient meeting uh, the criteria. Uh, 